Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC 237, Nama Yunus versus Andrade, and Shaq is going down this Saturday in Rio. Another pay-per-view in Brazil, and you know the Brazilian fans are always out in attendance. They always bring it. Uva Moer this Saturday night. It's going to be a great card. In my opinion, we got one of the greatest strawweight matchups, especially for a title fight in the history of the sport. And with Andrade's style and what Rose has been doing to the fact that she beat Joanna Champion two times and Andrade, I mean, we, we know what she brings to the table, uh, brutality. So it's going to be a great a great fight and a great card. Man, obviously the main event something to look out for. But man, you got Anderson Silva on the card. The return of the King of Rio, Jose Aldo. He's taking on Volkanovski. Lil Nog, Nogueira's on there. So, man, uh, they always stack the cards uh, in Brazil. And I have a feeling that it, this is going to be action-packed, man. It's going to be violence from start to finish. Yeah, we got great characters on the card. We got we got legends. We got prospects trying to trying to beat some legends. So it's uh Brazil's gonna have a have a great night. They absolutely are. And uh, let's get right down to business because first up. In the Bantamweight division, we got Hione Barcelos, he's 13-1, and one, and Carlos Huachin Quiroz is 10-3. and three. Currently, they got Hione Barcelos, minus 700. The comeback on Carlos Huachin Quiroz is plus 500. Well, Shaq, obviously, we've been very impressed with how Hione Barcelos has looked inside the octagon. He was initially supposed to fight Saeed Nurmagomedov, which would have been a much closer fight on paper. Now he's taking on a Peruvian zone, Carlos Huachin uh, which way are you going? I think I've been on the record to say that Hione's a future top 15 guy, and I, and I think uh, nothing's changed. I think he's going to run through this kid, Carlos. Carlos is 22 years old from Peru. I'm sure he's got a lot of heart. I'm sure he's very excited to be in the UFC. I'm sure he wants to spoil everyone's party, but unfortunately, I just don't think he's capable. I think uh, the second the fight is the Matt Hione should take his back and choke him out. But even if they stand, Carlos has never seen anything like this uh I think Hione's, you know, as close to a complete package. I mean, obviously, you know, he hasn't really fought anybody yet, but this uh, would fall into that category again. So I think he runs through Carlos pretty early. I'm going to say first round. I think, uh, I mean, I found out some stuff about about Hione. Uh, turns he's a, he's a Brazilian wrestling champion. He's like a five-time Brazilian wrestling champion. Uh, I think his dad's a red belt, you know, so uh, Hione's going to, you know, Roll through this one. Yeah, I mean, I think the minus 700 price tag, this this ain't a dog or pass situation at all. If anything, Hione should actually be a bigger favorite in this spot because when you're going from fighting Saeed Nurmagomedov, and that would have actually been a real fight. I mean, Saeed Nurmagomedov is serious, but Carlos Hewitt, you look much respect to him. He's on a streak. He knocks guys out, but he's from that Peruvian regional scene. If you know about the Peruvian regional scene, you know about Humberto Bandana. You know about Claudio Puelas, and uh, that's basically the level that... that, that Jesus Pinedo. Hey, this guy trains with Jesus Pinedo. That's basically the level that Carlos Huachin is on. Look, he's exciting. He knocks guys out, but I highly doubt he's knocking out Hione Barcelos. And I think that uh, one takedown in the fight will be over shortly after. So I'm going with Hione Barcelos via domination, via destruction, via first round finish. Next up in the welterweight division, we got Worley Alves. He's 12 and 3, and Sergio Serginho Moraes is 14 and 4. Currently, they got Worley Alves minus 145. The comeback on Serginho Moraes is plus 125. Well, Shaq, it's not often you get Brazilian versus Brazilian in Brazil. I mean, bragging rights are on the line. Who do you think walks away with the victory? That generally means the fans don't think one of them's Brazilian. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Sergio Moraes, we know his jiu-jitsu credentials. He had a tough last fight against Tony. I mean, look at the run Tony's been on. He's about to fight Damian Maia here soon. And Warley, kind of the similar thing, fought Kraus. I'll tell you what, Kraus looked a lot better at 170. He put a pace on Warley that Warley. Historically, Warley, if you make him work, he will get tired. And when he does get tired, he'll start looking at the ref, making excuses, you know, this and that. Props to Kraus, man. And he looked really good. Worley was a big favorite in that fight. Going into this card, Sergio was probably a popular thought as an underdog play because, you know, it's Worley. He quits a lot. He's not the toughest guy out there. Sergio losses only to uh, Usman, Tony Martin, Mutanchi, uh, you know. So on paper, it looks like Sergio should be favored here. But, you know, Sergio is getting up there in age. He is chinny. He does pull occasional stunts. You know, a la the Zach Otto fight in the third round, a la the Luan Chagas fights, fights where he's favorited very big, but this time he's the underdog. So I think it's a 50 50 fight. I think Worley might be the better puncher, the better striker if he's fresh. I think Sergio necessarily has the style to make Worley exert enough energy. Worley's a guy that, you know, he has to be able to manage his energy. If he's not able to manage his energy, then generally he's going to start looking for ways out. So as far as on the mat, Worley's got really good takedown defense, man. He, he's a solid athlete. You know, he's explosive. 
Joseph, I think it's a 50-50 fight, but I'll take the dog, Sergio Marais. I think he's a little bit more reliable at this stage in his career. So a very interesting fight. I know Worley gets all the all the heat for slowing down in fights. It's not like Sergio Marais has the best cardio either. But I will say this about Sergino. When uh, Omari started to slow down in that third round, Sergino did get him out of there. But Worley Alves, I mean, he's beat some legit guys too, man. I mean, a finish over Colby Covington, finish Nordin Taleb. Albeit controversial, he did go out there and beat Alan Juban as well. Finish Sultan Ali. So, Worley Alves has done some things as well. But, man, so has Sergino Marais. I mean, obviously, you remember uh, when he beat Tim Means, Davi Hamosh, Omari Ahmedov, Neil Magny in the first round. So, both guys have been there and done that. And uh, now it's about who's going to finish this fight. Man, it's really interesting. Uh, it's a very tough fight to call. But I'm going to slightly lean with the youth of Worley Alves in this fight. I don't think that Sergino is going to actually make him work from bell to bell like guys like Kamaru, guys like Brian Barberena. Those guys made him work from the start to the finish. And Sergio likes to take his time. He likes to pace himself as well. From a betting perspective, it's probably dog or pass because I kind of I kind of think it should be a pick em, But as a pure pick, I will go with Worley Alves here. Now, next up in the flyweight division, we got Priscilla Cachoeira. She's 8-2 and two, and Luana Carolina is 5-1. and one. Currently, they got Luana Carolina, minus 165. The comeback on Priscilla Cachoeira is plus 145. Shaq, you think uh, the contender series veteran Luana Carolina is going to get her first UFC win? Or do you think Priscilla Cachoeira is going to get her first UFC win? This could be that typical spot where you got the overvalued debutant UFC fighter coming off uh, the contender series. And on, in her contender series fight, she fought a 5-1 girl. It was really short. I mean, yeah, you know, she, she did her thing. Uh, but I'm not that impressed, to be honest, for her to be minus 165. Now, on the other hand, Priscilla, to be honest... <sighs> I don't, I don't think she's the type of girl that makes adjustments. I think uh, she trains at the same camp as Andraj. It's, it seems clear to me that at that camp, they like they have a specific style of not throwing any straight punches, not much defense, and just looking to throw big hooks. And I mean, she's just not very good, man. I mean, she gets hit a lot. Her grappling isn't the best either. Molly McCann was able to outgrapple her last fight. And I mean, her defense, I mean, she, I would almost classify her as a punching bag almost, man. So, you know, I think if Carolina can stay composed, I think that, uh, you know, she'll be able to touch Cachoeira whenever she wants to. I think that her Muay Thai is solid enough to do that. Now, Cachoeira does have the power edge. You know, they call her the zombie girl. She is durable. She is tough. She does have a fighting spirit to her. But I mean, you can pretty much see everything coming from a mile away with her, man. So, I will lean Luana uh, Carolina in this fight by by a close decision, but from a betting perspective, it's dog or pass because this girl hasn't proven herself. She hasn't fought anybody. This is going to be a big moment for her. I expect Priscilla to be a lot more comfortable, this being her third time in the octagon, as where this is Carolina's first time in here, and she really hasn't fought anybody. So I'm going to take Carolina just because there's so many holes in Priscilla's striking game that like it, it, she squares her stance, her chin's up in the air. She doesn't have the best cardio. Her footwork's terrible, so I'll take Carolina, but betting perspective, dog or pet. I'm gonna actually going the opposite way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Priscilla Cachoeira because even though the things you said are true about her squaring her stance, about her eating a lot of shots, but you know this is still a women's MMA, and you can get away with a lot of that stuff in women's MMA. And I think she will get away with a lot of that. And the reason I'm picking her to win this fight is because she does what Luana Carolina does not like, and that is go forward and throw big bombs. You saw in Contender Series when Luana's little four foot eleven opponent decided to charge her. All of a sudden, Luana Carolina walks back in a straight line, her chin's up in the air, she starts throwing punches that look like they were from bumfights.com, like it's some of the ugliest shit you've ever seen in your life, and then you think that same sentiment about Priscilla Cachoeira, because I know you guys recall some of her regional scene fights, but hey, Priscilla Cachoeira fought the UFC champ Valentina Shevchenko, she fought the Cage Warriors champ Molly McCann, and now she gets to fight Luana Carolina, who, I mean, this is a massive step down. And I know, you know, people on the show, you've heard me joke around. You know, it's fun to say stuff like, oh, Molly the Can McCann. You know, it sounds funny, but the reality here is that Molly McCann is a Cage Warriors champion. Luana Carolina has never seen anything like that in her life. Luana Carolina is out here beating cab drivers, beating uh, the lunch lady. So... I'm going with Priscilla Cachoeira, man. I think that her pressure is too much for Luana Carolina, her UFC experience. I think she backs her up, throws big bombs, and either wins the decision or potentially knocks her out. So I'm going to go with Priscilla Cachoeira here. Now next up in the lightweight division, we got Clay the Carpenter Guida. He's 34 and 18. And the former UFC lightweight and welterweight champion, BJ the Prodigy Penn, is 16 and 13. Well, Shaq... Currently, they got Clay Guida minus 600. The comeback on BJ the Prodigy Penn 
is plus 450. And, uh, you know, it, it used to be this whole thing about, you know, we joke around, oh, is BJ motivated, this and that. But now it's like, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about those reports that came out on this show because, you know, we don't stand for that kind of shit and we don't, we don't talk about stuff like that on the show. But, uh, I mean, do you trust Clay Guida on a minus 600 price tag? Look, BJ's fine because he owes that baby mama of his a lot of money, man. Look, when you're allegedly spilling coke on the baby, you know, I, think it's, I think it's, I mean, the guy's coming up for a paycheck. Look, I respect him, legend, this and that, you know, but Clay Guida shit's got better cardio. He's in better shape. He's won fights recently. BJ hasn't won a fight since when? Matt Hughes, 2010. Exactly. So, BJ Penn, we love the guy, but the guy... Uh, do we? <laughs> not really. <laughs> but uh, We the, used to love the guy. <laughs> the guy's just fighting for money, man. He, he's destitute at this point. Some people say, but man, Clay's old, but what about old-ass Dennis Seaver that came in and beat his ass? What about these, these fucking Ryan Halls coming in here, finishing him in the first round? I know Ryan's got the leg locks, but, you know, I actually thought BJ had a, a, a somewhat of a chance to win that fight. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, Clay should just come out here, tie him up, make him tired, and then BJ will just turn into a punching bag and Clay can get the biggest win of his career you know a guy that he couldn't even hold his jock strap you know 10 years ago when he used to probably look up to bj so this could be a good night for clay he gets to beat a, a guy that he never would have 10 years ago i mean this is like when clay guida fought takanori gomi you know gomi many years prior was the pride champion and comes to the ufc is completely washed up and guida got to feast on the carcass well now guida gets to feast on the carcass of the former welterweight former lightweight champion the hall of famer I mean, would I lay minus six on Clay Guida? No, I wouldn't. But I think he's going to win this fight. I mean, BJ Penn hasn't looked good in how many damn years? I mean, it's it's been over for a long-ass time. The guy's already retired three, four times. And I heard some people talking about, uh, he actually looked pretty good against Ryan Hall. If you think he looked good against Ryan Hall, I would like to personally refer you to my eye doctor because you are blind. He looked like complete dog shit against Ryan Hall. I mean, he didn't even land a punch the whole time, man. Like, how are you going to say he looked good? He looked like shit. So... He's not going to look good here either. I mean, people are asking, why does he still fight? I mean, would you not show up for 150K guaranteed if you knew that that was a, all you had to do is get into a cage and, hey, you can take a knee and quit? Even though he's so tough, he's Hawaiian, he uh, gets significant strike records set on his face instead of quitting. But, I mean, hey, when you get 150K to show, when you can, you know, re uh, <laughs> when you can just show up on your past laurels, on your past accomplishments and get six figures to, to show... I mean, that's all he has to do for work uh, this entire year. Actually, that's not true because cocaine is very expensive, Shaq, <laughs> so you might have to return in a couple months. But what I'm surprised about is why haven't they told him no more, BJ? Actually, I'll tell, I'll tell you why. Because they don't want him to go over to Bellator and start making money over there. They don't want him to go to to Rise and to Dream to all the. Does Dream even exist? They don't want him to go. They don't want him to go to Rise and to PFL and uh, potentially make money and that name Hall of Famer. That's why they're keeping him around, but. I mean, I got to think Dana's like, man, do we really have to shell out another 150K for this bum? So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with Clay Guida to be a third-round finish here. Now, next up in the Bantamweight division, we got Irene Aldana. She's 9-4, and four, and the return of Betch Cohea is 10-3. and three. And currently they got Irene Aldana minus 290. The comeback on Betch Cohea is plus 245. Well, Shaq, I know you read the article. Betch Cohea said her fans have been begging for her to return. The division needs her. I mean, I, she ain't going to get an argument from me there. Now the question is, who you got in this fight? The division don't need no bitch Curry. <laughs> bitch Curry ain't sniffing a fucking top 10 ranking again in her life. But uh, bitch Curry is, is good. She beat the number one contender, Jessica I. Uh, she wasn't the, yeah, I could, I should, just guy uh, lost to, just guy lost to Sarah fucking McMahon too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, Betchka, hey, I'm glad that she's back. You know, she's a, she's a somewhat of a fan favorite in a, in a funny sense. But, uh, now she's in here with Irene. Irene lost her first two. Then she won her next two against Talita and, uh, Pudilova in a fight of the night. Seems like she's a little bit more comfortable. Betch coming off this big layoff of eye surgery. I think two eye surgeries. And, uh... A vicious knockout loss. And, you know, Betch Correa, I do feel like her last two fights, she, her boxing has gotten a little better. I feel like her best uh, attribute is probably uh, not even... What's her best attribute? <laughs> <laughs> not even her uh, her uh, nothing skill-wise, just her intensity, man. You know, when when she sees Irene at face-off, she's going to be, you know, saying shit in Portuguese to her. And, you know, that and that can get in that can get in some girls' heads, man. Just as far as they match up, Irene is a lot taller. There's a big footwork advantage. There's a big speed, uh, speed advantage for Irene. All she's got to do is not fight close in brazil and uh i think she should win this fight 
Betch Cohea, she's been wobbled a lot. You know, I feel like her chin at this point probably is a liability. We're talking she's up two rounds against Mary or no, gets caught with a high kick and then uh, does the chicken dance and then gets 10 aided and then it's a draw. And then the Holly Holm fight where she was actually, I watched that fight, she was actually doing pretty well. Like up until that point, you know, Holly was punching a lot of air and then uh, she taunts her. And that was a stunt, man. She got, And then she got knocked out, you know, face plant. So I feel like Arena is the better athlete, younger, fresher, better chin. Uh, getting more confident, I think she'll win this by 30-27 decision. But uh, from a betting perspective, it could be a little high just because, you know, they're ladies. You never know how close it could be. And if it is close, then don't be shocked if Betch wins that split. But Arena is just too fast. Better, way better footwork. And uh, I think she gets this one. I think that Irena Aldana has made a lot of improvements since she came into the UFC. You know, when she was first there and she was minus 330 against, uh, what's the name of the chick that got fired that they didn't re-sign her contract before the Aspen Lad fight? The hippie girl, what's her name? Uh, Leslie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was minus three thirty favorite against Leslie Smith, and you know we thought it was this big joke, and then uh, she gets dropped against Leslie Smith, and we were like, oh my god, like this is the girl everyone's hyping up. But since that point, man, I feel like Irena Aldana's definitely turned things around. You know, she went in there against Lucy Pudilova, who for whatever reason can't win a decision to save her life, and whether you thought Irena won or lost, that was a fight of the night. That was a serious war, and that showed me her improvements, and. Uh, and she really showed that Mexican warrior spirit. She showed the improvement in her boxing, her composure, her experience, and that she could be a top 10 contender in that division with a little more seasoning. Now she gets the chance to go against the former number one contender, Betch Cohea. You know, Betch has... It's, 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 uh, it's Betch Cohea, man. How can you not love Betch? But uh, I, I'm going to guess that Irene Aldana wins a decision in this fight, man. And uh, I, hope to, I hope to see Betch back in there soon. Now, next up in the lightweight division... We got Tiago Moises. He's eleven and three, and Kurt Holabo is seventeen and six. Currently, they got Tiago Moises minus one thirty. The comeback on Kurt Holabo is plus one ten. Well, Shaq, I mean, I get the feeling this is loser goes home. Who gets to keep their UFC job? Yeah, man, it's a good, it's a good fight. You know, Holabo. When it comes to UFC, man, things just haven't gone his way, and they're kind of catastrophic fuck ups, to be honest. You know. Uh, the Hyoni fight, you know, Hyoni's better than him, but Hyoni's a bantamweight, and he handled him yeah, fairly easily. You said what? And a jiu-jitsu guy, and he handled him really easy. I mean, he was getting off on the feet to a point where, uh, you know, Halaba got overwhelmed badly, man. And then his next fight against Burgos, he's a big underdog. You know, Shane's out there fighting with his hands down. Halaba actually clips him, and then he gets armbar two seconds away by a striker. So, you know, uh... I don't know, man, but uh, Halaba, I mean, he's a tough guy. He's moving up to 55 from this one. You know, he's from Louisiana, so we know that Louisianans come to fight every time. He, he, he's willing to bang. Uh, I think his background is actually jujitsu. I think that's like his first art. Moises, we know that he's obviously better on the mat. The thing with Moises is it's all mental with that guy. You know, I feel like he, he might be talented. It's just that I think he's got a lot to live up to, Like kind of like Hione. You know, Hione uh, actually performs well, but I think Moises' dad is, a, is an accomplished MMA fighter. He's got a lot of pressure man and uh for whatever reason things just don't work out if you've seen uh, some of his fights uh in lfa when he fought uh man some old guy i forget the guy's name but he got a hella copter armbar in that fight but he got dropped prior to that and the guy's super old and slow and moises just doesn't like getting hit man if you pressure him then we uh saw him fight robert wiley who pressured him consistently moises didn't throw he backed himself into the fence for five rounds didn't really offer much but for whatever reason, this guy's name value on in the prospect seems seems to seems to hold a lot of weight for whatever reason. So he got a chance on contender series, fought a guy that missed five pounds overweight. Then Darius, no shame in losing to Darius, but it's the way he lost to Darius. You know, Darius took him down. He actually got up, but then it's like, why would you try to jump guillotine on a fucking guy like Darius? Like, how, what are the percentages of you actually getting a guillotine on Darius? Fucking almost zero. You know what I'm saying? And that just shows me that the kid. The kid doesn't have that fire in him to really fight, in my opinion, you know. And he, and he did it more than three times. I think he did it like four times. So, you know, I feel like Kurt, yeah, he seems like he's a popular underdog this week. Is he the most reliable guy, in my opinion? No, because if you really pull up Holabaugh's resume, I mean, the guy's beating absolutely nobody. He feasted on the ATT Muay Thai coach, Jay-Z Cavalcante, Yo, Danny Sedano, who lost to Cody Fister in the UFC. <laughs> you know, uh, Des, Green. Des Green, which is a complete robbery. I mean, Alaba, he's a journeyman. But oh, I'm, I'm going to pick him in this fight just because I think Moises just lacks heart. I think that he lacks a chin. He lacks a heart. And I think if Alaba can stay out of a dangle, stay out of... Stay off the mat with him. I don't think Moises has an offensive wrestling game. I think it's all, you know, Hail Mary type subs. 
But uh, I think I think Halaba should win it with aggression moving forward, backing this kid up into the fence and just punking the kid out. So I'll take Halaba by uh, 30 uh, 29 28 decision. Look, when I first saw the original line, I was super interested in taking a dog shot on Kurt Holabo. And then I watched Tiago Moises and I'm like, oh shit, I'm definitely betting Kurt Holabo. But then, I, then it came time to actually watch Kurt Holabo and talk about the stunts this guy pulls. I mean, look, Kurt Holabo is the kind of guy to go out there and uh, he gets knocked out by grapplers and he gets tapped out by strikers. You know what I mean? I mean, what else is there to say? When Hayoni Barca, when a jujitsu guy is throwing 10 uppercuts at you, like, you know, when jujitsu guys are getting off on their uppercuts, I mean, you got my boy Hayoni throwing 10 at a time against him and put him out cold. Then his next fight against Shane Burgos, I actually picked Kurt Holabo because I thought stylistically, well, Shane fights with his hands down, Kurt throws really hard. Kurt's probably going to go out there and knock him out. Well, Kurt knocked him down. Two seconds later, he gets tapped out by a striker. I was like, and I mean, look, the arm bar was nice. We can't talk shit, but it's like, Kurt, all you had to do was land two punches and the fight's yours. You know what I mean? Uh, so... I just uh, don't know what to think about Kurt Holabo. And you go back, you watch that fight with Jay-Z Calvacante, which was actually his last win. I mean, unless you count the Bassett fight. And by the way, you guys know Bassett's retired right now, right? So anyways, uh, you go back and you watch his last win against Jay-Z Calvacante. And this wasn't Jay-Z back on the Japan scene that was flying knee KOing everyone, the guy that was on that massive win streak. This was 40-year-old Jay-Z, two fights away from retirement. And... Uh, Tell me why Jay-Z is winning rounds against Kurt Holabaugh. You're supposed to run through the guy. You're supposed to make a statement that, hey, I'm ready for that UFC call. Instead, it was 29-28, Jay-Z Calvacante going into that fourth round. And uh, Kurt Holabo got an early stoppage. Props to him. But, man, I mean, the fact that Jay-Z is out there and you're not sure who's winning that fight at, at that point in his career, that's very alarming. So here in this spot against Moises, yeah, we can sit here and talk about how Kurt Holbo is the tougher guy, how Moises, uh, anytime anyone's ever stood up to him, anytime Tiago Moises has taken any kind of step up, he's been taught a lesson and it hasn't been close. The guy breaks when you put pressure on him. But the thing with Kurt Holbo is that he might put that pressure on him at first, but then he might get pinned up against the fence for three minutes straight. Then he might give up a takedown, not get back up the rest of the round. Then he might do something that Moises does, which is jump for a guillotine, miss it, be on his back the rest of the round. So what stunt is Kurt Holabo going to pull to fuck this up? You know what I mean? Because he's fighting a guy that he's way tougher than. But for whatever reason, like I said, man, this guy's out here getting knocked out by jujitsu guys and getting tapped out by strikers. So, you know, what what uh, what uh stunt is he going to pull here against Tiago Moises? So while I don't think Moises is the tougher guy, I actually think he's the more physically stronger guy. I think he's the more athletic guy. I think he's got better jujitsu. So I'm actually going to take uh, Tiago Moises to win this fight. And we can make talks about fading him in his next fight. Now, next up in the light heavyweight division, we got Antonio Hogerio Minotoro Noguera. He's 23-8. and eight, And Ryan Superman Span is 15-5. and five. Currently, they got Ryan Span minus 145. The comeback on Antonio Hogerio Noguera is plus 125. Well, Shaq, there was a point last year when I thought there's no chance in hell Ryan Spann ever makes it to the UFC. And boy, did he prove me wrong. Knocked out Alex Nicholson on the regional scene. Choked out Emiliano Sordi on Contender Series. Goes out there against KLB Henrique. Beats him in Brazil. Well, now he makes the return to Brazil. And you ain't fighting KLB Henrique anymore. Now you're fighting a Noguera, brother. Do you think Ryan Spann has what it takes to get the biggest win of his career? It's going to be a really good fight. A big step up in competition. Maybe not necessarily from uh, the skill-wise, but just name value-wise for sure for Spann. A little nog. Knocked out Sam Alvey as a big underdog his last fight. I feel like a little bit of that's carrying into this fight. And initially, I was thinking the same thing. But then when I look into it, you know, I feel like little nog, Sam Alvey's done. <laughs> I feel like Sam Alvey probably ain't going to win another UFC fight unless he gets like a fucking... A fucking... You're a not, uh, Yeah, another... Oh, yeah. Fuck. You're, you're a beef, beef, beef. You're already beef, uh, Ed Herman, I guess. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like Sam Alvey's days are, are coming to hey, an hey, end. Hey, who you got between uh, my boy Nagu Morano and Sam Alvey? Uh, Nagu Morano by decision. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, Span, you know, I feel like in the past, man, if you watch this guy's past career, I mean, he's had one of the most entertaining careers. I mean, from his days at 185, you know, he's a 6'5 guy. I guess his excuse back then is, you know, he's cutting too much weight. He had those losses to Trevin Giles by split decision, a fight in which he arguably won. But I felt like at times, I don't want to compare him to Johnny Walker, but kind of a similar 
scenario where like at times you know yeah he, he'd lose some of these fights but he would show glimpses of you know capabilities that guy's very talented like he'd show you a glimpse here and there and then it seems like as of recently maybe these last four or five fights that uh since he moved to fortis you know seems like he's a little more confident seems like uh He's just operating at a different level, man. Seems like people like to shit on shit on him for the Nicholson fight, which he was the underdog in a fight that he wasn't supposed to win. But if you really watched his past fights, I mean, he would have been out in his past fights, man. And the fact that he stayed in there and came back and to get a knockout shows me that he's making somewhat of a gang. Now, Little Nog, on the other hand, we know what he brings to the table. Good boxing, uh, suspect wrestling, suspect takedown defense, suspect get-up game. But he's a very tough guy, and we know he's got a sharp left hand. Span has been knocked out two or three times, I think. So, I mean, there's definitely a path to victory for Little Nog with that left hand if he can catch him. But I think there's a big gap in between them and youth. Just uh, durability, uh, athleticism, speed, power. Little Nog's going to be severely outsized in there this time. And I understand why he's a popular underdog because who the fuck is Ryan Span? But I feel like if Ryan Span continues the path that he's on, you're going to start seeing better performances from him. I think he's getting more comfortable in here. And uh, I question Little Nog's durability, you know. I'm not going to put that much stock into him knocking out knocking out uh, Sam Alvey, you know. I think that there's a clear path to beat Little Nog, and that's taking him down. I mean, he struggles to get up. Yeah, I know it was against Bader, but Span's got jujitsu. He's got wrestling. I feel like Span's got all the skills to be a ranked fighter at 205. Now it's about uh, him realizing that potential. I think he does on Saturday night. I think he finishes Little Nog. Man, I got to say, I've definitely uh, eaten my words on Ryan Span. Like I... Like I told Shaq, uh, as soon as the Alex Nicholson fight was over, I called Shaq. I said, this guy will never be in the UFC. And uh, turns out I was wrong. He is in the UFC now. He's fighting Lil Nog, main event of the prelims. Uh, but, man, so back in the day, Ryan Spann always had the athleticism. But, you know, I thought the guy was super chinny. I thought that, you know, it, not that his heart was questionable because you watch that fight with Alex Nicholson. And if that's not hard, I don't know what is. But. I just kind of like viewed him like a Chris Curtis. Like I just thought that, you know, he'll always fall short. You know, he'll beat these guys on the regional scene. But then when it comes down to that one big fight that gets you in the UFC, he'll drop that one. I just thought that he was going to be a local legend. But man, he fucking finished the guy on Contender Series in 20 seconds. Gets into the UFC, beats a former heavyweight in KLB Henrique. I got to give the guy a lot of credit. He's definitely improved. And in that KLB Henrique fight, I mean... There were some little slick transitions that Ryan Spann did. Uh, I can tell this dude. Uh, I can tell this dude gets in the gi on a weekly basis and trains his jujitsu because some of that shit he was doing as KLB, some of those transitions, that sweep he had off that off that uh, Dars choke. Uh, I mean, Ryan Spann's been putting in work, man. But that being said, it's not just the fact that he's fighting, you know, a legend of the sport allegedly. I mean, it's, no, it's a no Garrett brother. But man, there comes a different pressure when you're fighting a Noguera brother in Brazil. I mean, 4 a.m. in your hotel room, expect some prank calls uh, waking you up. You know what I mean? Uh, when you go to when you go to eat in the cafeteria, you better check your food twice. Like when you're fighting a Noguera brother in Brazil, you're gonna be set up at every single corner, and uh, I guarantee you, they're not trying to do Ryan Span no favors here. So. While I do think Ryan Spann has a path to victory, I mean, he's the much younger guy, he's fresher. I'm not convinced that he's the much more durable guy either. I've seen him get knocked out plenty of times. I've seen him get rocked on other occasions. I think that on the feet, while he might be faster, I think if Lil Nog touches him on the chin, you mix that in with the crowd going crazy. I think that, I think Noguera's going to knock him out, bottom line. But he's got to be careful because this kid is young and athletic. He is improving. He is experienced. So you can't just go in there and think there's going to be a walk in the park. But bottom line, at some point during some exchange, I see Noguera hurting him. And when Noguera does hurt him, Noguera turns up on guys. And uh, you saw how he handled Pat Cummins. You saw how he handled Sam Alvey. You saw how he handled Louise Kane back in the day. I think he's going to do the same thing to Ryan Spann. I'm going Lil Nog via KO. Now, next up in the lightweight division, kicking off the main card, kicking off the pay-per-view on ESPN+. Plus, We got Francisco Masuranduba Trinaldo. He's 23-6, and six, and Diego BJJ Ferreira is 15-2. and two. Currently, they got... 
Diego BJJ Ferreira is minus 165. The comeback on Francisco Masuranduba Trinaldo is plus 145. Well, Shaq, this is going to be a hell of a lightweight matchup. I mean, both of these guys are staples in the lightweight division, both super exciting, both Brazilian fighting in Brazil. Bragging rights are on the line, but more importantly, the winner gets to take a step up towards the rankings. Well, on Saturday, Carlos Diego Ferreira ain't Brazilian. He moved to he moved to USA, so they'll be <laughs> cheering for Trinaldo. I think uh, Trinaldo, you know, somewhat of a legend of the game. Uh, I feel like he's definitely on a decline in his last what two three fights, the Vic fight and the. Uh, the Dunham fight, you know, it seems like in the Jim Miller fight, it seems like he's definitely looking a little, I mean, he is 40. I mean, eventually the shit's going to catch up to you and Diego Ferreira is looking the best he ever has. So I feel like you got one guy a little bit on the decline and you got one guy on a major up. And I mean, ever since he lost to Dustin Poirier that night, bounced back with a, a win against OAM, stopped Gordon, stopped Nelson, and then uh, put a put a nice little last open on Ruslan in his home country. So I feel like Diego's looking the best he ever has. We know who's better on the mat. We know who's the better grappler. The big question this was uh well people are assuming that Trinado is a better striker yeah he's got the history of the knockouts and actually hurting guys but Diego Ferreira man his boxing has come a long way since he first came in I think he's popping the jab out now seems like he's a very comfortable boxer I mean if you look at that Ruslan fight Ruslan was supposed to have the boxing edge and uh Diego Ferreira beat him at his own game and on the mat and we know what happens when he gets you on the mat I mean he might put you on a little crucifix uh rear naked choke man so I think if the fight hits the mat, I think he could submit Trinado right away. We know that's always been the hole in Trinado's game. But even if they stand, I think that Trinado might get off, get off to a good start with some big shots. But as the fight progresses, as the older Brazilian gets a little tired, Diego Ferreira is going to start putting it on him. And uh, Diego Ferreira is going to win this fight. Yeah, man. Obviously, I got a tremendous amount of respect for both these guys, both total badasses. And when you talk about Trinado, the guy's 40 years old. And he's still kicking it in the top 20 of the deepest weight class in the entire sport. Not to mention, the guy hits like a truck. When he swings that overhand left, uh, just add Ch ask Chad LaPree about that. You know what I'm saying? Actually, he doesn't remember. But just, <laughs> just watch the replay. You know what I'm saying? The guy swings big. Super exciting. Devastating southpaw. And he's well-rounded too, man. He's fought everyone there is to fight. I can't say enough good things about Francisco Trinaldo. Now... One criticism about Carlos Diego Ferreira is that, you know, I see people talking about how he allegedly struggles with southpaws. And, okay, yeah, he lost to the champ Dustin Poirier. He lost to Benil Dariush, who was top 10 at one point in his career. Top 5, in my opinion, because he beat Michael Johnson when Michael Johnson was the number 5 guy on planet Earth. So, in my opinion, Benil was a top 5 guy at one point. So, he loses to two top 10 guys, and it's like, oh, he must be so bad against southpaws. Well, are you guys just not going to mention that OAM fight where he destroyed a southpaw his very next fight and you know i know that on the show me and Shaq, you know give the guy a lot of shit and stuff but uh at that time that's back when oam used to kick super fucking hard that's back when oam was on his come up man and uh diego ferreira taught that kid a lesson obviously you remember when he tied jared gordon's hand behind his back and pounded him out gave kyle nelson his first ufcl but most recently, that fight against Rustam Habilov, we were questioning what's going to happen on the feet. Well, it was Diego Ferreira that got the better of the feet. Now, traditionally speaking, his boxing, it ain't like, you know, if you show that to a, to a boxing coach, he'd probably laugh, you know what I mean? But for MMA, mix it in with Diego's confidence. And it might not look the prettiest, but the guy hits hard and the guy will go forward the entire time, does not care who you are, will stand and bang with anyone. And you start to slow down on a guy like Carlos Diego Ferreira. All of a sudden, uh, he's tripling up that jab. All of a sudden, he's throwing high kicks. All of a sudden, you're on your back. You have a third-degree black belt on top of you. Your arm's tied behind your back. You're getting pounded out. So the first uh, couple minutes of this fight is going to be intense. It's going to be chaos. Trinado's going to be throwing bombs. But if this fight hits the mat one time, It'll either be over shortly after or Diego will accumulate enough damage to where when they get back up on the feet, you will see Trinaldo huffing and puffing. And from there, Diego will look like he has a striking advantage, which he probably doesn't have while they're both fresh. But bottom line, I feel as if the jiu-jitsu of Diego Ferreira is going to be a big weapon in this fight. And this this ain't just any jiu-jitsu. This is third degree black belt jiu-jitsu. And uh, Diego's one of those guys that he tools regular black belts. So... This hits the mat, expect some funky shit on the feet, expect it to be competitive, but Diego's the younger, fresher guy here. I think he's got a little bit more in the tank, and as much as I respect Ronaldo, I got Diego Ferra to win this fight, most likely uh, via submission.
Hey guys, Dan here. Just wanted to remind you that Kyle Marley's bets are available at bestfightpicks.com. As you guys already know, in the midst of that 200 unit run, one unit equals $100 for Kyle Marley. So last week at UFC Ottawa alone, he goes out there and has a 28 unit win on the event. Now just think about this for a second. He's charging $7.99 for his yearly package. He just won 28 units at UFC Ottawa. 28 units. That's 2.8K. You pay off the yearly package with that event alone, and you still have 2K left over. You let me know if that's worth it or not. He's got monthly packages, yearly, or the event itself, all available at bestfightpicks.com. Kyle Marley's bets. Make sure you tail them. Bestfightpicks.com. Now, next up in the welterweight division, we got Tiago Pitbull Alves. He's 23 and 13, and Loriano Staropoli is 8 and 1. Currently, they got this fight a dead pick em. Minus 110 apiece, Shaq. So you got the former number one contender, Tiago Alves. You remember when he fought GSP at UFC 100. And you got Loriano Staropoli, who, I mean, he's only fought uh, Hector Aldana. He's minus 110 against the Pitbull. Do you think this line is warranted, and which way are you going? Tiago Alves had that uh, win over Max Griffin. Some people think it was questionable. Some people don't. It was in his home, in his, actually his hometown, like his hometown, hometown. Staropoli had a good showing against Aldana. People are saying, uh, who the fuck is Hector Aldana? You know, I was saying that before the fight. But, uh, you know, it's easy to say that in, uh, you know, after the fact, you know, because Staropoli was the underdog to Hector Aldana. I mean, I didn't tell them to make him the underdog to a foreign a four and one guy <laughs> so you know now he's a he's a pick him against Thiago Alves who arguably has probably lost five out of his last six hasn't really strung wins together since 2014 you no know, Thiago he definitely has heart he's definitely got a spirit he's definitely got a foot out the door with the coaching with the coaching realm uh, he's coaching Dustin Poye and Tony Martin and guys like that so he's definitely got a foot out the door as where well. I would definitely say Steropoli's got to be the hungrier guy I mean Alves like I said has got a foot out the door now skill wise Thiago still solid i mean he's solid muay thai same as usual man nothing's changed he's just uh he can't necessarily take the same shot that he once did nothing's really changed so his last fight he got dropped two or three times melander fight he got knocked out Kunchenko, Russian coasted him. So Staropoli probably isn't on that level. But one thing I like about Staropoli is he's got that Argentinian art, man. And with those Argentinians, and he's uh, training at shoot, uh, Shootbox Diego Lima. And if y'all know anything about that campus, man, while they're young, <laughs> while they're young and before the damage adds up, they were they are definitely willing to stand and trade. And they, and they do it at a very high frequent rate. So I feel like Tiago Alves... Definitely, definitely on paper has accomplished a fuck ton more than Steripoli. Steripoli hasn't really fought anybody. Just if you use that angle, Tiago Alves on paper could be lying the favorite. He's accomplished way more than this kid. But, uh, I mean, historically speaking, Tiago Alves doesn't string wins together, at least not in the last half a decade. So I'm going to go with Steripoli. I think he's younger, fresher. I think he's got more volume than Alves. I think, of course, he's got to avoid, you know, getting caught by Alves. But I, I'm not convinced that Tiago can eat the shots that Hector Aldana. Yeah, I know Hector's a jobber, but Hector's a tough Mexican. Tiago's an old Brazilian. I got Steripoli just by output. I think that uh, he's going to just the, the pocket exchanges are just going to go his way slightly. Not necessarily saying that he's going to land the cleaner shot. I just think Alves is going to feel his shot a little bit more. So I'll, I'll go with Steripoli. Very interesting fight for a lot of reasons. But first of all, one thing I want to address was this Loriano Staropoli versus Hector Aldana fight. Because I don't know if you guys remember, but for, for whatever reason... Everyone was acting like Hector Aldana was, you know, some sharp play uh, against Loriano Staropoli. Like, I told him to make uh, Staropoli the dog. So, you know, oh, Hector ain't shit. Yeah, say it now, you know. Yeah, say it now, but you, you guys were fucking laying minus 2-5 on, on fucking Hector Aldana. You like, look good against Keenan Song. Who the fuck is Keenan Song? <laughs> like, didn't, uh, didn't fucking that guy, what was the name of the kid that lost to Sage at UFC uh, 200? Enrique Marine. Did Enrique Marine finished that motherfucker. Enrique Marine finished Hector Aldana. Look, people were acting like they knew something we didn't know when they were betting that Hector Aldana. Like, it was the sharpest play, but no one knows about it. And, and, I, yeah, and, and, and go go <laughs> go back and listen to our UFC Argentina episode. We were not on that train. We both picked Loriano Staropoli. Uh, if you bet Hector Aldana against uh, Loriano Staropoli, I feel like you're almost obligated to bet Tiago Alves. Because, I mean, who the fuck is Hector Aldana? At least Tiago Alves... Last fight beat Max Griffin, controversial or not. Actually, when I went back and watched it, I kind of low-key did score it for Tiago Alves, uh, as controversial as that might sound. But, like I said, everyone that thought they were sharp playing Hector Aldana, you, you better be playing Tiago Alves in this spot. But as far as this matchup is concerned, 
Man, it's a pick em for a very good reason. This is a true pick em in my eyes. The reason why? Well, Loriano Staropoli ain't fought shit before. The, the biggest step up in competition he's ever seen is fucking Hector Aldana, who is at the bottom of the barrel in terms of uh, the welterweight division. I mean, he's out the UFC, bottom line. But uh, And Tiago Alves, he's fought GSP, John Fitch, everybody there is to fight. And he's still exciting, man. I mean, you go out there, you look at his stand-up techniques, lands devastating leg kicks just like he used to back in the day i mean he might not do it like he did to josh koshek back at ufc 90 you know what i'm saying shaq but he still he still throws those leg kicks and uh one thing about loriano staropoli is he's very flat footed he's very heavy on the on that lead leg he is open to the leg kicks so that is one weapon for Tiago Alves that I think he will be landing in this fight. But that being said, Loriano's got that Argentine spirit where he just goes forward the entire time. Like I, you guys know my boy Santiago Genchiboa Ponzinibbio, which look out for him. Fight news coming soon. But as far as Loriano Staropoli, man, he's a young Ponzinibbio. I mean, he's not seasoned. He's not experienced. But he's got that heart, that will to win. And the dude just throws bombs. Loriano Staropoli brings that brawling style to the octagon super exciting one thing i really liked about his ufc debut yeah it was a low level fight but the dude's got a motor the dude can push for three straight rounds and that's really important because with tiago alves i've noticed uh you know he does slow down some fights but i'll tell you what his last fight he dug deep he lost the first round big and you know whether it was a case of max griffin gassing out after not being able to put him out in that first round that's when tiago came through uh second and third bottom line tiago dug deep that last fight but the question is how many more times can he dig deep like that you remember that carlos condit fight where you know he took that big elbow in the second round and he didn't want to quit man they had to stop the fight between rounds so tiago is definitely a warrior man now it's about how is he going to respond to these big shots that Loriano brings to the table because they are going to stand and bang till either one man falls or till this goes to the scorecards. And initially I was thinking Tiago wins this fight because, you know, this kid's never seen anything like this. Tiago can, you know, time the counters with the leg kicks. But honestly, man, I feel like that volume of Steropoli is going to present a lot of problems. I could see this fight being very close. I can see it being very violent. Uh, this is the toughest fight for me to call on the entire card. And I think it's a pick em for a reason. I was initially leaning Tiago. I'm starting to lean a little bit towards the youth of uh, Steropoli. I mean, I know this doesn't mean shit, but honestly, when was the last time Tiago strung two wins together? 2014. 2014. He just got a win, so expect two more L's. And, <laughs> and, and, after, and after this fight, you're going to say he was two. Steropoli fought an old guy. You know what I'm saying? After this, they'll find another, <laughs> another reason to disrespect my boy Loriano. Uh, not a confident pick, but I'm I'm going to go with Loriano via decision. But this fight right here, this is where shit gets real, my man, because next up in the featherweight division, we got Jose Aldo Jr. He's 28-4, and four, and Alexander the Great Volkanovski is 19-1. and one. Well, last time a guy named Alexander the Great fought a legend, he got smashed. But this ain't no Alex Hernandez. Who's this the, is who's the other Alex? Alex Hernandez. Oh, yeah. That frog. <laughs> <laughs> His nickname shouldn't even fucking be the great. You know, like. <laughs> Who the fuck has Alexander Hernandez been? <laughs> <laughs> he got lucky. But look, Jose Aldo's minus 130. The comeback on Alex the Great Volkanovsky is plus 110. So, man, the Kiwi is making the trip to Brazil. And he's is not he, just. Is he a Kiwi? Oh, is he an Aussie? I think he's a, yeah, I think he's, he's, an, Aussie. An, he's an Aussie. <laughs> but he's trained. He's an he, he trains at a uh, city kickboxing. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So he's a fake huge. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, currently they got Jose Aldo Jr. minus 130. The comeback on Alex Volkanovski is plus 110. Uh, you know, they call Jose Aldo the king of Rio. This is in Rio. In order to go there and win a decision against a guy like Aldo, you can't tiptoe. You can't pull in Elias. You can't do the whole bit. You got to go out there and fight the guy. Is Alex Volkanovski going to fight the guy? Speaking of Elias, they need to get that fucking ring girl out the UFC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the fuck some of that shit he was doing last weekend was. But, uh, yeah, so Jose, man, last two fights, man, put it on Moicano, and he put it on Jeremy Old uh, old Heathen Stevens. Jeremy most lost <laughs> in UFC history, Heathen Stevens. <laughs> you know, Jeremy 500 uh, Heathen Stevens. So Jose was the underdog in his last two fights in hindsight. You know, I, I'm going to say, 
say in hindsight, because, you know, going into those fights, I, I think I might have, I know I picked Moikano, kind of, I don't know who I picked in the other one, but, uh, Jose, man, he had to step down in competition from Max Holloway, and then he fought Moikano, who, let's just be honest here, Moikano got punked out. <laughs> I got Brazilian I mean, that too. I mean, Moikano got straight up punked out. Look, when that fight got announced, look, congrats to Pedanaris and Jose at work. They, they instantly hopped in Moikano's comments on Instagram, and they were, and they were picking on him, and they called him a, a fake Brazilian, and, you know, he moved to Florida. He's an American boy now, you know, that's what they said, and Moikano responded, and, you know, that just shows that that, hey, it, it worked, you know. <laughs> the crowd booed him at Wayans. They booed him on the way out. I mean, Moicano's from Brazil. To get a to get a reaction like that, I mean, in his home country, I mean, imagine how he was feeling going into that. And congrats to Jose. It worked, man. And then you know his fight with Jeremy, you know Jeremy Old Heathen Stevens. I mean, look. If you don't know how to beat Jeremy Stevens at this point, like, I mean, Moicano beat that guy like three years ago, you know. So, I mean, look, Jeremy's a hard hitter. As as far as how that fight went, look. They were standing literally in front of each other. Jeremy kind of wobbled him a little bit, and then he swung for the fences, like unlike the vet that he is, just like uh, the stunt puller that he is. That's why he's five hundred. That's why he, you know, has the most losses in the UFC. And Jose hit him to the body, walked him down, and uh, that was a great read, man. That was a, you know, that was a good move by Jose, and he knocked him out. But the the difference in those fights, Jose was being counted out in those fights, and now he's back to being the favorite. Because now they think he's he's got that he's still got another run in, another run in him and he he might man and uh, Volkanovski on the other hand his competition level up until you know his last fight Chad Mendes was his first signature win and now he's gonna try to get two in a row I, if you want to consider Elkins a consider uh, a signature win but I mean up until that point man you want to know how. You determine if a prospect's uh, ready for the prime time. When he did fight the Pugnuses and the the Shane Youngs and the Kennedys, he absolutely beat all of them. He beat all of them the fuck down. So that showed me that he was a clear, you know, class ahead of those guys. And then just about his fight with Chad Mendez, you know, uh, a lot of people are, in, in hindsight, going to uh, say that uh, Chad's old, he's on his way out, he's done. But, I mean, Chad's, who's got the most uh, knockdowns in featherweight history? Who bludgeoned Jose's face in Brazil? Chad, Chad man. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, Jose beat him for sure, but, uh, I mean, let's not act like Chad doesn't hit like a fucking truck. Let's not act like Chad isn't a juicer that injects the, that uh, that meat in his house <laughs> with uh, steroids. I mean, the guy hits like a fucking truck, and the reason why I love that performance so much from Volkanovski is that lets me know that he's once again ahead of these guys that they're going to try to at that point, going to try to feed to Mendes, man, because we saw what happened when Miles Jury, going into the fight, I think everyone and their mom was on Miles Jury that night, man, and Chad hit him with one punch, and that was it, and that's what happens when Chad touches a lot of guys, Lamas, uh, fucking Guida, Guida, Lance, uh, you know, I mean, Chad's got a, got a great resume, and the way that Volkanovski broke him down, a lot of people are under the assumption that Chad was winning that entire fight, I don't get it, I feel like Volkanovski was breaking him from the opening bell, I feel like the only success Chad really had was where he did catch him and, uh, and dropped him, but I'll say Volkanovski's cardio was on point, because his recoverability was impressive right there, I mean, he didn't take any follow-up shots, he got immediately up, and he got right back to pressuring him, and that's what you you need to beat a guy like Jose Aldo. You can't be like Moicano out there idolizing him, or asking him for a, for a selfie, asking for an autograph, asking for pictures with their family, you know what I'm saying? And uh, Moicano got punked out. He stood out there in space, tried to point fight him. Probably not the best way to fight uh, Jose. You need to make Jose exert energy. Now, if Stevens could have been a little bit more cozy, that's probably closer to the way. Or like Holloway, stay on him, stay on him. We know how Holloway fights. Holloway throws a fuck ton of punches. So I think that if Volkanovski comes out here and stays on Aldo, makes this cage feel really small, make Jose swing early, similar to how he did against Chad Mendez. I think Volkanovski's got the chin to eat Jose's shots. Uh, of course, I don't think he's going to take him down, but I don't think he necessarily has to. I think he just needs to make him clinch to work, get those Brazilian, you know, how old is he, 30? Yeah, between you and me, it's like 30. <laughs> you know, get those resilient muscles working. Get those resilient muscles tired, man. And we know what happens when Jose gets tired. Now, of course, you know, the champ's the only one and uh, uh, that cokehead. What's his name again? 
Connor. And Connor to uh, to capitalize. Well, that was a 13 second knockout, so he really didn't capitalize. We know Connor ain't beating anybody in a in a war of wills, but <laughs> no, that's just facts. <laughs> and that's just facts. But uh, if 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 Okanowski can walk Jose down, I truly believe that he can gas Jose out. And I feel like you know Jose, we're not going to really see that much improvement from him at this stage in his career. But Volkanovski still got a. He's still. We're going to see a better version from the last time. We're going to see an even more crisper version. I think the version he showed last time was a much better version of the one before that when he fought Elkin. So I expect to see more improvement from Volkanovski. I think he comes out here, makes Jose swing early. I think the early stage of the fight is definitely going to be a little nerve wracker. If Aldo catches him, then props to him. But I don't think he will. I think Volkanovski's got those big, strong you know, former 200-something pound bones, rugby player. I think he eats his shots. I think he gets Jose tired. And then I feel like Volkanovski knocks the great legend Jose Aldo out in Brazil. And unfortunately, the Brazilian fans might be crying and shedding tears, but that's okay. Aldo's a Hall of Famer. Anderson Silva's up next. <laughs> Anderson, we'll get, Anderson's coming back right after that. So I feel like Volkanovski is the guy. I feel like the difference between him and Moicano and guys like Jeremy Stevens. And guys like uh, Frankie Edgar, for nice. example, Lamas, is that he ain't scared of them. You know what I'm saying? Those guys low-key were broken going into the fight. You know, you got Jeremy saying, shit, I'm going to low-kick Jose. Then you got Moicano, who already explained that situation. So I feel like just fundamentally, mentally, Volkanovski's got what it takes to beat Jose, and I think he will. Man, amazing fight. Cannot wait. So I hear a lot of people talking about how... Well, Jose is going to win the first round, and and Volkanovski is going to win the third round. So who's going to win the second round? And I just think that's the most lazy analysis I've ever heard in my life. Like you, you literally just saw that this fight was happening. That's what came to your head, and then you moved on. And but like bottom line, all bullshit aside, I think that Volkanovski is going to make Jose Aldo work, and that's the key fundamental here. That's the one thing Moicano didn't do. And you know, I'm a big fan of Moicano. But when you watch Moicano fight someone like Brian Ortega, you know, win or lose, he lost that fight, but he's out there swinging. It's a real fight. And when you saw him against Jose Aldo, I mean, obviously he got punked out before that fight even started. And that's facts. I got Brazilians telling me that Moicano was, I mean, Guy even was like, oh yeah, he did punk him out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I got Brazilians telling me that uh, Jose Aldo and his people punked out Moicano before that fight. Because, I mean, when have you ever seen Moicano not throw any strikes at all? And and then, you know, he gets to the center of the cage. He pulls out his favorite Aldo poster, gives him the Sharpie, has him sign it, has it say to Henato. So I was just like, man, no wonder you lost that fight. One left hook, uh, his eyes rolled back. He he turned his back to the legend, and that's that's a standing TKO. And uh, with Jeremy, you know, I, going into that fight, I kind of thought that, well, Max just set a significant strike record on Jose's face twice in a row. So Jose's probably done, and, you know, Jeremy was actually on a three-fight win streak. He was looking the best he's ever looked. Yeah. He stopped being that stupid brawler, and he actually started – putting out more output. You go and you watch his fight with Gilbert Melendez and uh, his fight with Josh Emmett, and it was like a different Jeremy Stevens. And uh, then uh, he, he, re he resorted to his old ways against uh, Jose Aldo and uh, reminded everyone why Jeremy Stevens has the most losses in UFC history. Now, that being said, enter Alexander Volkanovsky. He is not going to ask for a signed picture in the center of the octagon. He is not a man with the most losses in UFC history. I mean, the guy's 19-1. He's on his title run right now. Basically, he's at where Jose was at when Jose was uh, about to fight Mike Brown back in the WEC. Alex Volkanovsky is on that upward trajectory. But stylistically speaking, the reason I think this is a good matchup for Alex is is, like I already said, he's going to make Jose Aldo work. You know, if you're someone like Lamas who, you know, was just happy to tell your friends that you got a title shot and now on the resume, no matter what, you'll always be that guy that got to fight for gold. And that's all he was happy doing. He ran away the entire fucking time, man. Alex Volkanovski is not going to run away. If Alex loses this fight, it's going to be because he got knocked out. He's, he's going to get right in Aldo's face, and he's going to make him work. And the one thing that we've noticed in Aldo's past, you know, he did get caught by Conor McGregor, but... In that max fight, even let's say the fifth round against Lamas, let's say the fifth round against Hominick is uh, the guy's got a questionable gas tank. And in those fights with, with Hominick and with Lamas, those guys weren't even making him work. So now imagine when someone's in his face throwing big bombs trying to make him get into a brawl. Now imagine what he's going to be like in that third round in a real fight, in a fight fight. So that's why I think that this whole... Aldo's going to win the first round. Volk's going to win the third round. Who's going to win the second round? I, I think that's a joke because this is going to be a real fight from the moment the bell rings. So it could end in the first round. It could end in the second. It could end in the third. If it goes all three, 
it's going to be very interesting. But bottom line, I, I see at some point, maybe maybe late first round, maybe mid second round, Jose. I mean, is he going to be able to just keep answering back over and over? If Volk is still standing, I don't think Jose is going to have an answer for him as this fight goes on. And at some point, I think Volkanovski knocks out the great Jose Aldo. It's going to be a sad moment uh, if you're not betting Volkanovski. But uh, much respect to Aldo, man. I mean, talk about the greatest featherweight of all time. Talk about a guy who... I mean, Max might have something to say about that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Jose defended the belt more times <laughs> as of right now. <laughs> he got starched twice, man. But uh, look, look, when he was in his day, man, uh, Jose did so much for the featherweight division. I mean, the featherweights weren't even in the UFC back when he was in the WEC. And he was the first UFC featherweight champion. Uh, that Mark Hominick fight was amazing. But the Kenny Florian fight, you know what I'm saying? Man, it's time to move on, man. It's time for new blood in this division. Yeah, it's time for <laughs> Max Holloway to have a new challenger. And that new challenger is not going to be a third matchup with Jose Aldo. That new challenger is going to be Alex Volkanovski. I got him via knockout here against the great Jose Aldo. Now, next up in the middleweight division, we got Anderson the Spider Silva. He's 34-9. and nine, And Jared the Killer Gorilla Cannoneer is 11-4. and four. Well, currently they got Jared Cannoneer minus 140. The comeback on Anderson Silva is plus 120. Shaq, would you ever imagine a minus number next to Jared Cannoneer uh, in a matchup with Anderson Silva in Brazil? There's a lot of different opinions on Anderson. You got some people that think he's completely done, and then you got the fans. Some he's got his loyal fans that still think he uh, can challenge for a title. So, you know, uh, Anderson's just one of those type of fighters. So, Cannonier, I mean, look, his last fight against Branch definitely looked the best he ever had. I mean, dropped down to a new weight class. He looks shredded, bigger, you know, just leaner, leaner than he's ever looked. But I do think there's a chance that, you know, people are slightly just overrating the spot that he's at in his career with that one win at 185 look david branch is a nice guy that's but, exactly what it is. <laughs> david branch is a nice guy I'm, he's invited to my barbecue anytime like we could talk we could talk about how he beat uh you know louis taylor or knocked out my head you know or got slammed by <laughs> gerald harris <laughs> but uh look yeah, David Branch was coming off the best win at the time, and Cannonier put a run to his uh, to like, not really a streak, but put you know, an put an end to his uh, to his its title run at one eighty two, end to his title hopes at one eighty five. But uh, like I said, you might be overrating the spot where Cannonier is at in his career. He's only got one win at one hundred eighty five pounds against a guy who. You know, look, we've been telling you for a, a while. A guy who ain't ever going to win another UFC <laughs> You've been telling you for a while that Dave Branch is on his way out here. That's why we bet on my boy Jack the Joker. Shout out to my boy Jack the Joker. Uh, went away from the UFC title shot. Look, it was a good performance. He, he actually got up from the takedowns. And he, uh, I mean, Ken and low-key been getting better. Like, all in uh, pretty much most of his fights. I mean, um... He's just been fighting bigger guys, but you know, I feel like it's still the same thing with Cannoneer. If you avoid the knockout, he really doesn't have the details in his game to win a decision, to uh, sometimes avoid takedowns. That won't be a factor in this particular fight, but just in general. Anderson Silva, on the other hand, he had a good showing against Israel. He definitely lost that fight, but the fact that, you know, he's in there with a the guy, I don't know what the, the age difference in between them is. But the fact that he can still fairly, you know, go technique for technique with the, the with the interim champ Israel, you know, shows me he's still got a little bit left. And I still consider Anderson to be able to beat. I mean, he is a top 15 guy. I still got him over a lot of top 15 guys. He already beat Brunson, who's number nine. I mean, come on now. We got him over Elias. That's a top 15 guy. Tavares. We got him over uh, Brad Tavares. I mean, I'm sure some people would disagree, but I got him over Tavares. I got him over Branch. I got him over... <laughs> uh, who else is top 15 in that division? Uh, all those guys. All those guys. You know, all those guys. So, I pretty much got Anderson against everyone except Carlos Jr.? Uh, um, Carlos Jr. I got I got him over pretty much everyone except the top five and Paolo Costa. You know, so I do consider Anderson Silva still a top you know, 11, 12 middleweight. Now he's fighting Cannoneer, who who just beat the number 10 middleweight, even though he, between you and me, he really wasn't number 10. He got lucky. Mahetta fought with his hands now. <laughs> Mahetta thought he was such a joke. 
Fight with his hands out. <laughs> he had to fight with his hands out his way. It's like, but uh, as far as this fight goes, man, I feel like it's the same thing as usual with Cannonier. If you avoid the bomb, Cannonier sometimes fails to make adjustments. Now, I feel like long term, this is going to be the new home for Cannonier. I feel like long term, he probably will get back into that top 15 if he takes an L here. Fighting Anderson Silva is a little bit different than uh, even fighting Aldo, in my opinion. You know, I feel like uh, Anderson Silva is that guy. He's just got that mystique about Fight's him. Fight's already begun. Yeah. The, like, first he's gonna be really nice to you <laughs> he's gonna want to hug you and kiss your forehead and you know uh, say hey to your kids and things like that and you know he's got that mystique about him in the cage man and guys at times end up like Brunson you know end up staring at him and like uh Hanato did with Jose asking for autographs the closer to the fight Cannoneer is gonna start probably feeling that pressure a little bit but just skill wise yeah Cannoneer hits like a fucking truck we we know this and Anderson at times has fought with his hands on it has been a bit of a Bit him in the ass in the past, like when he fought Bisping, like when he fought uh, Chris Weidman, even though he knocked Bisping out, if we're being honest. <laughs> I had a bet on Bisping, but uh, <laughs> fucking, uh, you know, that was a great fight. But, you know, I feel like Anderson still got it, and I still think that he's one of the all-time best weasels. And I haven't used that word in a while, but Anderson, man, you could just see the we Like, he is a great weasel, man. And when I say weasel, the guy just, he can give you that false sense of security as if not much is really going on. Put his hands down a little bit for you can hit him. And then just when you think you're getting a little bit more comfortable, kind of like the second round with Israel, man, he might start coming after you a little bit. Israel, he's a champion, of course. He, he's 17-0. and 0. He's about to fight Whitaker for the world title. Cannoneers, what's his UFC record? 4-4. Four 4-4. And four. Four and four. He's just a 500 fighter when we really look at the scheme of things. every Everything on Cannoneer, I feel like, is based on a projection they feel like that at 85 he's about to y'all really think he's about to be a title challenger like 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 come on guys like he ain't beating her manson he ain't beating gasolum he ain't beating uh Yo israel well. he ain't beating you well he ain't beating paulo. paulo you know he might be weidman <laughs> <laughs> he might be brunson he might be brunson he could be like kenan there's a top 50, a 15 guy like like 12 to 15 you know anderson's probably around there too as well maybe like eight nine but uh kenan just I don't want to say he's a choker, but I just think that everything with him is based on power. So I feel like if Anderson can, you know, get this to the score, because I wouldn't even be shocked if he rocked Cannonier. We've seen Cannonier rock by Reyes. I know Reyes is a giant. He's a 205er. Blakovich dropped him as well. Another 205er. Top five 205ers. He has been dropped before. You definitely don't expect him to get taken down here. But I just feel like personally... In this type of fight, Anderson should be the favorite here. I feel like Cannoneer should be trying to upset Anderson Silva, not Anderson Silva trying to upset Jared Cannoneer. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, a 500 fighter in the UFC. So, I'm going to go with Anderson Silva. I really don't know. I can't tell you honestly how the fight's going to play out. But I do feel like Cannoneer might have a little pulling the trigger issue here and there. Just enough for Anderson to weasel a decision. Just enough for every time he throws the crowd to go absolutely crazy and to sway the judges into scoring these rounds for Anderson. So I'm going to take Anderson by controversial decision. I mean, let's be honest here. The judges have already been paid off. The, <laughs> the scorecards have already been written. It says 30-27 Silva. So this shit hits the scorecards. Uh, you're good to go, Anderson, but... Obviously, you got to respect the power that Jared Cannonier brings to the table because, you know, when we talk about Jared Cannonier, we're not going to sit here and talk about his jiu-jitsu. We're not going to be like, oh, you got to look out for his double leg. It's the right hand. The guy has a big right hand, a lot of power, knock guys out before. That's what you got to look out for. But uh, let, let's talk about some things such as who has been dropped more recently between the two. It's Jared Cannonier. Who has been knocked out more recently between the two? Jared Cannonier. Who's been dropped in two of their last three fights? Jared Cannonier. Now, I know someone's going to be like, oh, but that was at 205 pounds, as if that's not a big deal. Let me ask you this. Who's the last guy Anderson fought at 205? DC. How many times did DC knock down Anderson? Zero. Who got hurt one time on the feet in that fight? DC. So don't sit here and give me any bullshit about how, oh, but when Jan Blakovich dropped Cannonier, that was at 205. Therefore, that doesn't count. Anderson ain't out here getting dropped at 205, and he's actually out here fighting guys like the champ DC. So... You guys can uh, put that argument on the back burner. Now, as far as Anderson and Jared is concerned, I mean, look, it's KO or bust for Jared Cannonier. So that right there, I'm like, why is he the favorite? I mean, if he goes out there and knocks out Anderson, much respect to him. But I think Anderson's got a really underrated chin. In my opinion, uh, well, this isn't my opinion. This is facts. The only time Anderson's ever been knocked out was against Chris Weidman back in 2013 when he was playing around. He thought Weidman was this big joke. He thought he had the fight in the bag. I mean, it was what it was. 
No one is exempt from taking that first canvas nap, but since that point, he's fought basically all champions and uh, hasn't uh, <laughs> hasn't been knocked out since. And we're talking DC light heavyweight champion, Israel Adesanya middleweight champion, Bisbing former middleweight champion. And that Bisbing fight, if that shit was in Brazil, you know, uh, not only is that a fourth round knockout for Anderson Silva, it's also you know if they let that fight start the fifth, uh, he uh, he's winning that decision too. So a lot of these decisions that people act like he's been quote unquote giving away. I mean, he fought Israel in New Zealand, he fought Bisbing in England, and he fought DC in Vegas. Look, you can fight DC anywhere. If you're not John Jones, you're gonna lose that fight. So it is what it is, man. But as far as him and Jared, look. I think that Anderson's going to be running on the outside. I think he's going to be taunting. I think he's going to make Jared fight uncharacteristic. And I actually think that he's going to take a little bit less risk in terms of the taunting. Do you remember those times when he had his hands down and he just ate like a three-punch combo yeah, right on the chin against Israel? Yeah. I don't think he's going to do that against Jared because I think they kind of know Jared does have that one-punch uh, knockout power, whereas Israel is more of a, an accumulation type thing. But shit, Anderson went out there and straight up won the second round against Israel Adesanya, who's the middleweight champion. So... I mean, that shows me that he can hang at this level. I say at this level. Jared ain't on this level, guys. <laughs> it's Jared that's stepping up in comp. I mean, when we talk about Jared's wins, much respect. He beat Dave Branch, who we've always thought is completely overrated. Besides that, he beat Nick Rorick. He beat Iwan Kutelaba. And he beat Cyril Asker. I mean, congrats, man. It's awesome. But to come in here and beat Anderson Silva, you got to land that right hand on his chin and hope he goes down. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Anderson Silva is going to win this fight. If it goes to decision, for sure. But don't don't write off the possibility of Anderson coming out here and knocking him out either because, you know, Jared does charge recklessly. And if he can't get that knockout, man, I think he's going to start swinging some bombs. I think he's going to close his eyes. And I think he might eat something straight down the middle. So I'm going to go with Anderson Silva to get an upset. It sounds crazy saying an upset against Jared Cannonier, but he is the dog here. So... I'm going to go with Anderson Silva to get this upset. Main event of the evening. Strawweight title on the line. Got the champion, Rose Namayunas. Thug Rose, she's 8-3. and three, And Jessica Andrade is 19-6. and six. Currently, they got Jessica Andrade. The challenger is minus 120 to walk away with the title. The champion, Thug Rose Namayunas, is plus 100. Shaka, this is literally the best fight in strawweight history. Who you got? Yeah, I don't know what's worse, uh, having a champ that lost to uh, Carolina and Carlo or a champ that lost to uh, Marion Renault and Raquel Pennington. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so this fight is going to be great. Like you said, the uh, the greatest strawweight matchup, in my opinion, in the history of the sport. Rose came through for us last time as the dog in the rematch to uh, – Joanna champion. That was a great win. She went five rounds to solidify that she's the real champ. And Andrade, we know what she brings to the table. Ferocity, intensity, big cooks, and power, man. She's coming off that big, vicious KO over uh, Karolina Kovalkiewicz. So, uh, man, one thing I noticed about this fight, just like watching tape on the three girls in particular, Andrade, Nama Yunus, and uh, Joanna, is, man, when I say there is, in my opinion, when I say there is a big gap between those three girls and the rest, as in the rest, uh, who Suarez, uh, Anzarov, Calvillo. huh? Calvillo. Calvillo, the Wileys, the, the the Watersons. When I say there is a big gap between those the, those three girls and the other girls, like it's fucking huge. Like those three girls are like, in my opinion. Unless one of them other ones, like, gets better drastically, like, I see those three being, like, just fighting each other for a while, man. Because, like, Suarez, look, I, I know she's got all this hype, but I, I promise you if Andrade hits her with one of those shots, that will make her see the life of God and she will fucking shoot, and shoot from halfway across the cage. So I think there's just a big gap between those three girls and the rest of the division. So Rose, you know, I feel like uh, in the past her big thing has always been her heart. Is she going to quit? Is she going to, is she not going to quit, man? But, you know, look, she said that she's, uh, she's always struggled with us. Uh, so, I mean, look, fighters are coming out these days and just being open with it we saw the champ Dustin Poye come out and say Hermanson. I struggle with it Hermanson said that he struggled with self-doubt look that's a normal thing now man like these guys are coming out so I'm not gonna put that much stock into it as far as the matchup though Andrade I honestly when I watch the tape Andrade this is Andrade's thing Andrade really ain't that good in my opinion it's just her strength will probably beat 90 percent or more than 90 percent of that division I mean 
when girls get hit like that, most of the time they're just going to quiver away and back up. It's like a man. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time it's going to work out. Now, the one time that she absolutely miserably failed against Ioana Jacek, I mean, when I say Ioana, like, I hope Rose and Trevor Whitman watched that fight because there was one thing that stood out. Fucking uh, Andrade doesn't check low kicks. Now, Andrade tried the same shit, and she tried to uh, bum rush Ioana. She cracked Ioana on the chin, swelled up Ioana's forehead instantly. Uh, so, Rose, I mean, look, there's a chance that Rose doesn't like the shots. Like, let's go ahead and put that out there. Like, Rose might eat one of them shots and be like, oh, my God, let me, I want to go home. You know what I'm saying? Like, there, the yeah, like, there is a chance of that. But one thing I noticed is Andrade, like, that's the only way she can win. There is no adjustments going on. There is no popping a job, jab out there. Like, there is no, like, uh, let me change my angle up a little bit. Like, it's just bum rush and just throw hooks and let's see if she quits. You know, let's see if she slams through. <laughs> yeah, she's got some slams, but she's actually got uh, fairly good top control. But, you know, those slams are all strength. They're not traditional double legs. In the late rounds, those aren't going to really work, you know, unless her opponent is quitting. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, Joanna didn't quit. Joanna kind of had her mentally broken going into that fight. You know, Joanna at the time was the bully of the division. I consider Andrade to be somewhat of a bully just in her fighting style. So, yeah, so she cracked Joanna right off the bat, swelled her forehead up, and then Joanna, every time they got back in space, tagging that leg with the calf kick. As the time, you know, added on, Andrade couldn't really use that. She couldn't get that explosion because one of her legs were fucking, you know, <laughs> you know not very good, man. So, Joanna did the game plan to a team, man. So, I'm assuming Trevor Whitman watched that fight, and I'm assuming they're going to throw a lot of low kicks. Now, one thing I've always liked about Rose, even prior to her being champion, you know, I've always low-key known that she's capable of a lot of shit. You know, she's very talented. I mean, we've known that since she was on Ultimate Fighter. She was clearly, in my opinion, the best girl, you know, in terms of finishing. She was actually out there finishing fights, you know what I'm saying? Like, hurting girls, like, with hands, like, and she's really not that big, man. And I feel like she's got the best boxing in the division. I feel, I mean, the fact that she knocked out Joanna cold, like, that's a, in my opinion, like, that's a feat that, like, <laughs> I know Joanna's a little chinny these days, but to who, actually. Who else has knocked her out? <laughs> exactly. To actually knock her out cold, like, for a chick to do that to Joanna, like, that was fucking impressive in a way. that, And then to go out there and do it in five rounds is very impressive. Now, Andra just got to. Got to knock out her last fight, too, against a, a fighter that's on her way up. A fighter that beat Rose. <laughs> exactly. Like we said, man, if you want to hold on to Carolina's win over, <laughs> hold on to that win from 2000 and fucking, you know, 15, 16, whenever it was, things change. I mean, look, Hermanson was getting tapped out by Cesar Ferreira a couple years ago. Now he's attempting chokes on fucking Jocker Ray. <laughs> like, you know, things change so fast, man, in the sport. Like... These little these fighters can get into a groove and mentally they can you know go to the uh, go to the roof. So you know I feel like Andrade, you know her style's nothing's gonna change her. She's gonna try to punk Rose out with the punches. And personally, I just feel like you can't do that with somebody like Rose. Just like how she couldn't do that with Joanna. Those girls are just a little bit too more skilled. Yeah, I know it's gonna work against Tisha Torres, who's already scared going in. And by the way, Tisha Torres won a round in that fight unanim unanimously on all cards. I mean the first round was really ugly. Uh, I'll admit that. I mean. If you can, if you got good footwork and if you got good straight punches, I feel like Rose can land something on Andrade that makes her really see stars. Like I know physically it doesn't really look like that, but she knocked out Ioana and Jacek. She hurt her again in the second fight, closed her eye up, and I feel like Rose has got the the straight punches to to make Andrade pay for for uh, swinging being reckless like that, man. But like I said, there is a, there is a chance that uh, Rose doesn't like the shots. It's it's kind of hard to gauge, but personally. I feel like uh, Rose, uh, Rose has the footwork, boxing, the range, the feints, the distance to just give Andrade a little bit of a harder time. And when Andrade has a harder time, she makes a lot of mistakes, man. But she'll get away with those mistakes because she's fighting fucking Carolina, who's already, you know, yeah, she beat Rose. But what has she done after that? Absolutely fucking nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And she's out here getting beat up by Watterson, going to split with Felice and not finishing Jody Escobel and shit. So, you know, yeah, I, I know you can do that then. And I know you can beat Tisha Torres. You know, who, who was on a streak? I, I guess but Tisha, I mean, she's on a three fight skit now. You know what I'm saying? I, like I said, I just feel like those three girls are on a class of their own. I'm going to go with Rose Nama Yunus. I feel like she's got the, uh, I don't really know who has the edge on the mat because, you know, and Josh does have the slams and it's all about Rose's, you're going to know, you're going to know who, who who's going to win this fight very early. You know what I'm saying? Because like I said, Andrade doesn't have many 
avenues to she doesn't really have different paths to victory it has to be by a girl not liking the shots and her quitting you know what i'm saying and uh if that doesn't work out she is fucked because rose is a straight right she's got the left hook she's got the footwork and don't be shocked if rose knocks her out i mean i've always low-key felt like rose is one of the few girls that can actually knock people out so i'm gonna go with rose nami i'm gonna go with the champ i know it's in brazil i know it could go the other way but i just think that andrade ain't gonna be able to just walk her down and just start swinging hooks if you watch that first round in the tisha torres fight like that that was kind of ugly man so I'm going to go with Rose. I'm going to go with Rose. I think she could submit her. I think she could uh, she could uh, possibly win a five-round decision, possibly get a knockout. I could also see Andraj actually doing her typical thing. But I'm going to go with Rose. I just think I got to go with the champ with more ways to win. I think she's just a better overall fighter. I think Andraj is just a specialist at that one aspect. But I respect Andraj. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Man, this is such a good fucking fight, and could be fight of the night, could be fight of the year, could be knockout of the year too because, I mean, someone could get an early finish in this one. But like I said earlier, this is literally the best fight in strawweight history. And it seems like it's a foregone conclusion in the MMA uh, community that Andrade is just going to come out here, put that pressure on Rose that has historically given Rose problems in the past and uh, that she's going to be the new champion in Brazil. I mean, that's what everyone's saying, that it's that simple. I mean, she's got the pressure style. Roses cracked before. Go ahead and take this belt. And may maybe that does happen. I mean, I know you recall that Tisha Torres fight when Tisha did buckle uh, Rose Nama Yunus, but. Oh, Angela Hill dropped and dropped. Did Angela Hill really drop on Josh? <laughs> Florida has a hobo. So, my, my boy Shaq's letting me know that uh, Angela Hill dropped on Josh, guys. Um, what do you guys have to say about No, but listen, as far as this matchup is concerned, you know, I, I know you guys have heard me in the past, you know, make the jokes about the emotional support dog and, you know, and she's got, my, my girl Mishka. And, and, my, and my boy, you know, Pat Perry is like 50 years old and Rose is like 15. Like, so, you know, you've heard the jokes, but, but all bullshit aside, man, Rose Namajunas is one of the most improved fighters in uh, women's fighting history, man. And she's always had the potential, but now she's obviously living up to it. I mean, she's a defending champion. This is her second title defense. She knocked out Joanna Janjacek and uh, then beat her in a five-round fight after that. So she's definitely proven herself to me. And, I mean, in the past, I mean, you saw the flying arm bars. Nowadays, you see the head kicks. You saw the five-round decision. So she can win a fight via any method possible. Whereas with Cheska Andrade, I mean, it was unbelievable how she knocked out Carolina, but... You know, that ain't the same Carolina that went out there and beat Rose at UFC 201. And that wasn't the same Rose that we see now. That was, you know, that was part of uh, paying your dues to get to where you are at this point. So, Jessica Andrade, look, I kind of see this being like the female version of uh, Lineker and Sanhagen. You know what I mean? It's going to be a lot of fun while it lasts. Jessica's going to come throw her big bombs. And if that works, if that's able to, you know, really, if, if Rose really does succumb to that pressure, then... Hey, you're going to see a belt wrapped around Jessica Andrade's waist. But let's say she doesn't succumb to the pressure. Then what? What, what adjustment is Andrade going to make? Because all she has in the arsenal, she's got big hooks and she's got a nice uh, a nice slam. You know what I'm saying? And if she can't get off on that, then what? Because I'll tell you what right now, Rose has a lot of facets to her game. She can pop the jab. She can use the low kicks, the flying knees. Obviously, she's got some, she's got a nice double leg as you saw in uh in that fifth round against Joanna. But uh, what about her back takes, man? What about her rear naked choke? If she gets on the back of Andrade like Sarah Morass did, like Je like uh what's her name, like Rocky Pennington did, don't be surprised if Jessica Andrade gets tapped out here. So like Marion Renault. <laughs> oh yeah, Marion Renault tapped her out too with a triangle. I mean, Jesus Christ. So. What I'm trying to say here is that Rose has more ways to win this fight. Rose can win via knockout decision and submission, whereas I feel like Andrade, it is in Brazil, so maybe we'll throw a decision in there, but I really feel like her only path to victory is a knockout here, or it has to be a severe beatdown to a TKO type thing. But man, I really see this being a back and forth fight where maybe Andrade can come out here you know, get that first or that second round, but I feel like they're going to be alternating rounds. But man, it's good that you bring up that fight with Tisha Torres because... And that kind of showed the blueprint on how to beat Andrade, as if we haven't seen it in the past already. It's just that we know with Tisha, <laughs> Tisha's not a big game fighter. <laughs> Tisha chokes in her biggest moments. I mean, you know. Tisha's okay with not getting her ass beat that bad. As long as she doesn't get fucked up, she's good with that. Tisha's the Kenny Florian of the women's <laughs> division. You know, she'll beat everyone else except uh, when it comes to the title shot or the number one contender fight. And that's just how it is. 
But in this fight, man, I think that Rose is going to keep her distance. When it's time to counter, it's time to counter. And be very selective with your shots in there. Be opportunistic. If she gives up her back, take it, choke her out. So everyone's uh, going on Draj, and Andraj might win. Hey, best of luck to you guys, but uh, I'm going on the opposite side. And still, the strawweight champion of the world, Rose Nami Yunus, I think that she chokes out Jessica Andraj. Now we got to hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. And joining us now on the Big Marley Minute is Big Marley himself. Kyle, it's going down this Saturday in Rio. You know the Brazilian cards are some of the best. Uh, title on the line. How's it going? Good, man. Coming off a killer week. Ready to have another one. Uh, we got a pay-per-view this time, so the contests are a little bit bigger on DraftKings. Yes, sir. The stakes are high. Uh, looking to get another big weekend. And, man, Jessica Andrade versus Rose Namajunas. I mean, dude. Talk about the best fight in strawweight history. Which way are you leaning, man? I mean, you going with the champ or are you going with Andrade? It's a pick em for a reason. On DraftKings, they're kind of leaning uh, Andrade's way only by a little bit. Uh, what's the what's the Big Marley opinion here? Yeah, I love this fight. Um, it's going to be a good one. Stack in cash. It should score highly. I'm um, definitely looking forward to watching it, but uh, I like Rose to get it done here. I mean, definitely not super confident. I'm not going to go 100% on Rose or anything. I'm going to have Andrade lineups too. But we get uh, Rose for a little bit cheaper. She's definitely going to outscore her price tag if she wins. And I think she can definitely get a submission in this fight. So I'm going to take Rose here, but this is going to be an all-in fight for me. There won't be a single lineup I make without this uh, fight involved in it. So at that mid-range, you're just going to have to pick it. If you want to make a side, go all-in. I think it's a little ballsy. I probably wouldn't do it. But I would probably go a little heavier, something like a 7-3, and 8-2 and two if you're making 10 lineups. But I'll favor Rose. You think a lot of people are going to have the stack here in the main event, Kyle? Yeah, in cash, I believe they will. I don't really think it's GPP stack worthy, um, so I'll just pick a side there. Um, but, yeah, definitely I'm going to stack it in cash. We're getting over 100 points in this fight for sure. So co-main event, you got Jared Cannonier taking on the legend, Anderson the Spider Silva. And if you would have told me you know, six months ago that Jared Cannonier would be a, a favorite over Anderson the Spider Silva, in Brazil, let alone anywhere, I, I would have laughed at you, but that's the case, man. I mean, Anderson is 44 years old. Jared is coming off the big knockout win. Uh, you about to pay this 8700 or you think uh, there's some value here on the dog? See, I don't know. I definitely like um, Silva. I think he has a chance to win this fight, and he's only 7500 so I'll definitely have some lineups with him. I just don't see him scoring highly if he gets a win. I think it's probably going to be a decision if he could pull it off if he can get a knockout he's for sure going to pay it off so if you think that's the case throw him in your lineups but i do think he can get the win so i really don't want to pay up for canyon at 8700 um although his path to victory is the knockout and he's got heavy power it could definitely happen if he gets the knockout he's got a good chance of being on the optimal lineup so i won't full fade him but i'm picking anderson to win this fight so i think it's a good fight to fade if you're making like one lineup this is going to be a popular one so i think fading it might be a smart way to go because if anderson wins with 60 points that's not going to really help us so my pick is going to be anderson to get the win but i think the best move is just to avoid this fight let everybody else soak up the ownership so i think the fight that we all really want to see here is jose aldo versus alexander volkanovsky i mean a lot of people are riding jose aldo off after the losses to max holloway after the loss to conor mcgregor they were saying he was done, but man, what a way to rebound with those knockouts against Jeremy Stevens and most recently, Hanato Moikano. Is Alexander Volkanovsky the guy or is Jose Aldo about to make it three straight? Yeah, this is my favorite fight on the card. Can't wait for it. Um, it's going to be a close one, but I have to lean with Volkanovsky here. It is in Brazil, though, so I'm, I'm a little less confident, and I don't think he finishes him. I don't think he's going to have a whole lot of success with takedowns. So he's probably going to have to beat Aldo in a standing fight in Brazil. So he's definitely got a tough task ahead of him. But he's a beast, man. And at 7,800, you just kind of have to target him because he's never had uh, less than 100 points in one of his wins. He scored 115, 107, 116, 129, 100, and 107. So I love that kind of ceiling. I'm not sure he has that kind of ceiling here, but he's definitely going to pay off $7,800 if he gets the win. So I'll be targeting him. Uh, I'm going to pick him to win, but again, I, I can't full fade Aldo here, so I'm definitely going to have to have a couple lineups with him, and I wouldn't talk anybody off of a Aldo lineup and full fading Volkanovski if, if you really wanted to do that. Um, he looks legit. 
he, he's not really losing much of a step. Um, it's just a really top-notch fight for both sides. I can't wait to watch it, but give me the underdog once again. And man, Tiago Alves is taking on Loriano Steropoli. And for, Steriop- for Steropoli, talk about a step up in competition going from Hector Aldana to, to Tiago Alves, man. So you think he can pull it off here against the seasoned vet or you think the former number one contender gets back on track or actually not gets back on track, extends his uh, win streak to two? <laughs> uh, well, it is in Brazil. He could extend that to two even if it is a close fight that should go the other way. <laughs> very, very um, true. But no, I mean... I don't know. It's. I think I like Staropoli more here. He is 200 less on DraftKings, so that could be swaying me. Um, I just think he has the better path to getting a finish here, and that's what we're looking for. If Alves goes out there and gets a decision win, it could be 60 points, and that's not going to help us a lot. I mean, it could be the same with Staropoli, but I did like him in his last fight. He, he impressed me a good amount. Uh, and then Alves, I mean, he's really – He's really definitely lost a step. He's not impressing me as much as he used to, that's for sure. Uh, his his wins are not that great. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to save the 200 bucks here. Give me Staropoli. So I'm going to have a lot of money here to save with picking four underdogs on these first four fights of the main card. Man, and, and that's a great point. But, man, this lightweight matchup between Diego Ferreira and Francisco Trinaldo – I think this is one of my most anticipated fights of the night, man, because obviously if it hits the mat, we both got to edge Diego Ferreira here. The dude's obviously a third-degree third black belt in jiu-jitsu. He's unbelievable. But the question everyone has here is what's going to happen on the feet, and I'm kind of curious to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, on the feet, man, I, I see. I think Ferreira's the more technical fighter. I think he's going to put up a little bit higher pace. Um, so if I knew there wasn't going to be a finish on the feet, give me Diego but I think Trinaldo is more dangerous on the feet. And at $7,200, he's definitely worth targeting because I think his most likely way to get a win is by knockout. Or if he can you know, rack up takedowns and not get submitted, I just think that's a more dangerous game plan. So I think he's going to try to keep this fight standing and hunt for the knockout uh, at that price. If he gets it, you're almost going to need to have him. So I won't fade him, but my pick here is Diego. I think he's just the better all-around guy. He's going to have a speed advantage. Uh, he's looked great. It looks like he's in his prime right now. And Trinaldo's over 40 at this point so he, he's not going to keep it up forever so give me the favorite in this one I think he's going to get it done but probably by decision well Kyle that's why you are the DraftKings guy for half the battle it's going down this Saturday in Rio UFC 237 they can get your bets and your write-ups at bestfightpicks.com that's right man went uh six and oh last weekend huge week won like 8k on DraftKings only charging eight bucks for uh for all my secrets so go over there buy that let's make some money Yes, sir. And they can follow you at Big Marley 3. It's all available at bestfightpicks.com. Kyle will speak soon. All right, man. Good luck. Take care. And that's why Kyle Marley is the DraftKings guy for half the battle. Well, Shaq, now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC 237? My fight to watch is going to be Alexander the Great Volkanovski versus Jose Aldo. I mean, how can that not be the fight to watch? If Alex wins this fight, I mean, in my opinion, he's got to get a title shot over these quick jobs like Sabid and, you know... uh, I don't think there's anyone else, to be honest, right? So, Emmett ain't getting no title <laughs> <laughs> There's no one else. So I think if he wins this fight, you know, he's going to get a title shot. And if Jose wins this fight, the crowd's going to go nuts, man. They're going to, he's going to jump into the crowd. And, uh, but if he loses, the fans will be crying. They will be, uh, throwing stuff at Alex when he's walking through the tunnel. <laughs> but, uh, man, I just think stylistically that's a great fight. Jose's power is, is Chris Boxing. I think uh, Alex has Chris Boxing as well as pressure. I think it's just going to be a fire fight the entire time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Seriously, when's the last time you missed an Aldo or Volkanovski fight? I cannot wait for that. My fight to watch is uh, BJ Penn and Clay Guida. Just kidding. My fight to watch is Diego Ferreira versus Francisco Trinaldo. I mean, not only is it Brazilian on Brazilian crime, but both these guys, Tr- Francisco Trinaldo, he wants to get back into the lightweight top 15. Diego Ferreira wants to make his debut in the UFC top 15. Uh, both these guys are total badasses. They can both finish fights uh, in any area of the game. And I just have a feeling that there's going to be a little 
extra intensity with the Brazilian bragging rights on the line. So for that reason, Diego Ferreira versus Francisco Trinaldo <laughs> is my fight to watch. <laughs> well, Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for USC 237? My fighter to watch is going to be Lariano Steropoli. Look, I'm a big fan of the Argentine spirit, man. I, you know, I, I consider this kid Little Pons Jr., you know what I'm saying? So I'm interested to see how he handles a vet like Tiago Alves, a guy like, you know, who we said in the past has fought everyone there is to fight. Like I said, I think he's got a foot out the door. I think he's on his way. I still got a lot of respect for him. I think he's a great fighter. But, uh, you know, just the fact that if Steripoli could get this win coming off the Aldana fight, prove everyone wrong. Don't be shocked if uh, you got a new staple on those Spanish on those Spanish in cards, man, you know, then they'll start to push Lariano. And I mean, eight and one to beat a guy like Alves, I think it's an impressive win. Well, I mean, they're putting him on the paper for a reason because yeah. they know he's not about to hump legs. So, little Pons Jr. <laughs> so it's going to be a hell of a fight. Uh, for me, my fighter to watch is Anderson the Spider Silva. I mean, remind me the last time Anderson was an underdog to a 500 fighter, especially in Brazil. And then you top that with the fact that he is the greatest middleweight champion of all time and Jared Cannonier looked better than he's ever looked against David Branch and I mean you parlay a, a win over David Branch with Anderson Silva all of a sudden we're looking at a top 10 opponent next so for that reason Anderson the Spider Silva is my fighter to watch well Shaq we did it it's going down this Saturday UFC 237 UFC Rio live on pay-per-view on ESPN plus they can follow you at MMA Genius 05 they can follow me at best fight picks our bets are available at bestfightpicks.com been on the underdogs all year and uh plan to continue those ways this weekend as well bestfightpicks.com subscribe to half the battle on iTunes SoundCloud YouTube Stitcher and Spotify our Instagram best fight picks official thank you guys so much for the support we sincerely appreciate it we love you all and until the next time Let's cash these bets.